Our lovely host for that panel, Miss Carol Bedford, who's no stranger to us. Just give a wave, Carol. And I'm going to hand over the mic to her. That's her. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right, so the next panel is going to be historic, and I want you all to pay attention. And so I'm going to call the team that will join us, and we have somebody who's going to join us online. But I'll introduce your principal, Mr. Maurice Wilson. <laughs> Established and proclaimed and famous athlete, manager, agent, negotiator, brand manager, QB Segovin. President of the MVP Track Club and one of the greatest track and field statistician, Bruce James. Marlon Gale is a coach in field events and is making his name more and more. How many, he will tell us how many medals Jamaica has in the field events. So this panel and joining us online, we have Mr. Adrian Laidlaw, another agent slash manager for track and field. Now listen, this does not happen anywhere else in the world. We don't have this kind of panel in any sport anywhere in the world. And so you should give yourselves a big round of applause for being here. When you think of the big agents in the business of sport, you talk about Chris Paul, he's one, but here we have so many. And each of the people on the panel will just get an opportunity to talk probably a minute or less about themselves, and then we'll go into the question and answer. We're gonna be talking about everything about the business of sport, specifically track and field, because that's what we are extremely famous for. So we'll start with the principal. And in his capacity now as somebody who has coached and won several high school championships, and really how he met QB, talking about the transition as an athlete from high school to, um, Elite. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me take the bass out of it. So my journey started many years ago when my mom bought me a book. And on the cover of that book was Donald Quarry. The year was 1976. Don't try and check my age. In that year, Donald Quarry had won the gold medal where was it again? Um, Montreal. In Montreal, Canada. And so there used to be a Peace Corps volunteer. Those persons of... They used to jog around the community. And so my mom became my first coach. So I used to jog around the community. And by sixth grade, I was a champion boy for St. Anne at the time, even though I was not from the parish. I suffered a major injury and could not attend school for three semesters. After passing my common entrance, I went to high school to research the sport, because I used to read a lot. Nancy Boy, you know those books. Hardy Boys, Matt Boland. I used to read the books that the females read but I used to hide and read those books. So I went <laughs> academic, if I should say. Then I went to college. And when I went to college, I started to train again under Fitz Coleman. And I ran 48 seconds on the dirt. But then I said to myself, if I was to apply science to coaching, I think I would make a greater contribution. Because how my track and field career ended, there was this footballer who on sports day, 
I got the baton before him and he ran past me and everybody laughed after me. So I said, that's it for, for track and field. Then in 1988, I went to the stadium to watch the greatest 400 meter of all times, in my mind, with Donald England and Thomas Mason. And I left the stadium and I said to myself, I can make a difference in 400 meters and I'm going to apply science. So that was how my interest in the sport began. And then later on, I went to Homewood and I had a very successful team of coaches. We won nine straight championships, 10 overall. Um, and the story about Homewood, you know, I had gotten a scholarship to go to St. John's University to study. But I, I said I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could win championships. And that was how I researched GC Foster College and decided to come here to do my pre-degree, uh, pre which was my bachelor's, which was one of the best moves I ever made in my life. So in a nutshell, that's, that's my journey, and I'm here now. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. To the veteran on the panel, QB, one minute, QB. So the biggest misconception is that I'm Jamaican. But actually, I was born in Guyana, raised in America, and I'm Jamaican by adoption. But my history in becoming into athletics was I went to, I went to college to study sociology and political science. And in 1972, I had a room with an extra bed as there's two people in a room. And around September, the RN in the dorm came to me and says, hey, I have this athlete that just came back from the Olympics and they need a roommate, do you mind? And I said, no, of course not. Well, it turned out to be a very famous Jamaican athlete at that time that had just gone to the Olympics and had ran in the semifinals of the 200 meter, the Munich Olympics. But in the process that we were in school, he never would go to class. And what happened was I started helping him with not only his schoolwork, but because he was so good, a lot of companies, footwear companies, wanted him to wear their product. And so I was the person who started talking to the footwear companies for him. And um, so in my second year of college, I decided to change from being a sociology and a political science major to advertising and marketing. And then that led into having an MBA in business management. But because of that connection, I was able to come right out of college and I started to work for one of the shoe companies and I worked for Puma from 1972 to 1986. And I was doing all the promotions. So from then on, I became an adopted Jamaican and that's how my loyalty is to Jamaica and Jamaican athletics. And you know, for 40 years I was doing it and Guyana never reached out to me and asked me to help them. And I did a Sportsmax interview, I think it was a year ago, and I mentioned on, the, on the, the Sportsmax, the same thing I'm saying to you, that I was born in Guyana. And it went all over Guyana and everything. And then all of a sudden, everybody was reaching out to me that, you know, why are you helping Jamaica? Why don't you help Guyana? So fortunately, I started helping them uh, last year. And I think you know about three or four of their athletes that are now coming to the top. I think two trains in Jamaica and two trains in America. So that's my history of being initially starting in athletics. Thank you. Well, I'll go with the microphone that does work. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bruce James, and the word I'm gonna start with is, or words, horizontal, integration. Now, to my left is Marlon Gale, and he knows that vertical jumps are the jumps that go up, such as high jump and pole vault, and the horizontal jumps are the ones that go forward, the triple jump and the long jump. Why am I saying about horizontal integration? 
I learned that while I was at school, and I wondered how would I ever use the concept of horizontal integration in my life? Well, this is how it has happened. In 1999, Paul Francis, Stephen Francis, David Noel of blessed memory, and myself formed the MVP Track and Field Club. And our goal at that time was to coach athletes after high school. That evolved to eventually managing the athletes, which evolved to eventually getting athletes on Jamaican teams to the Olympics and the world champs, which has now evolved to us saying, well, we coach them, we manage them, what else can we do? One of the things that athletes need are track meets. They need to compete. So we decided to invest in some equipment and start hosting track meets. So we've gone from starting with coaching to managing to now managing track meets. And this horizontal integration is paying dividends because people realize that we understand how to coach, we clearly understand how to manage, and therefore we know how to deliver track meets that not only coaches and agents want, but that athletes want. And I see a number of athletes here. And it's always very reassuring to us to know that when we put on a meet, that the athletes actually feel they can do their best, they feel that they're treated well, and that's what I'm talking about, horizontal integration, coaching, management, and then the, the meets themselves. Hope to speak to you some more. Pleasant afternoon, everyone, or morning. Uh, my journey started a little bit different from everyone here, and definitely I would have learned from their success as time progressed, but it started from a school called St. Mary's College, where my first love was javelin, but at that time, they never offered javelin at boys and girls champs. In fact, I never got the chance to go boys champs our girls champs because at that time it was Eastern champs and then if you were good enough. So the school at that time did not go to boys and girls champs. So I started the middle and long distance event, fell in love with sport and I started late um, at third form. Uh, completing high school, I got the opportunity um, for three scholarships and for some reason I chose physical education and sport. The first one was medicine, the second one was electrical engineering, but I chose this because um, I like to interact with people and I like the science that is linked with human performance from all levels. So I started my studies in Cuba. Of course, in studying in Cuba, um, the Usain Bolt, um, the start of Usain Bolt's um, career and so forth, all of that was happening. And I also had the dream to continue there as a 400 meter athlete. It didn't happen based on what we were told before. But I came up with this. If you can't be the best athlete, then you be the best coach and educator. And the journey pretty much would have started there with doing my practicum at the Ciudad Deportiva, that's the national, um, the stadium where the national selection would do their training. I started also working with the sprinters, but what I was seeing then and what I read about the, our outstanding coaches here, I said to my professors, I want to do something different. I want to contribute to something that Jamaica at the time wasn't very outstanding in, and that's pretty much how the field events, um, the love for it would have started. All right, so on the stage, that's a lot of history. Also online, we have Mr. Adrian Laidlaw, another member of the setup within the MVP unit. And he has worked with track and field, but also maintains a profession outside of that. Um, we'll now hear from Adrian briefly how he started in the business. Okay, thanks. Morning all. Well, after hearing my colleagues speak, I feel unqualified to, I mean, even join this group. But uh, as it relates to track and field, I ended up in it by accident. Uh, I retired much earlier from track and field than Coach Wilson. I retired, I think, at age 10 or 11 
in which he had a four by four tryout of Walnuts, got the baton in fifth, ended up giving the baton in fifth, and there were only five people in the race, passed out after the race, and there was immediate retirement for, for me. I switched sports and moved to cricket. But one year, I ended up working at Pete Marrick Management Consulting, and that's where I met Steve. Well, I knew Steve and Francis from before, but Stephen had asked me when I started working there if I could manage Wilmot's track and field team. Wilmot had lost. Wilmot was supposed to win champs. I think that was 91 or 92. Uh, crazy as it seemed, it's even if Wilmot had a chance, but we lost. We lost the Calabar. My brother would beat me to a pulp in terms of why well, there's no way Wilmot stand a chance to beat Calabar. And that was sort of an incentive when Steve said to me, come and help the team, because I thought, yes, we could really beat them. Anyhow, fast forward, I think it was 94, Rudolph Mighty, who I thought was an incredibly gifted athlete, got a scholarship, returned to Jamaica a year later. It didn't work out. Met with Stephen and Glenn to say, can we do this, have the athletes stay? in Jamaica, where we give them more options. Glenn and Stephen were a little skeptical, pressured, pressured, pressured. Uh, I relocated in losing a coin toss to my wife in 96. Keep speaking about it. And in 98, Stephen said, OK, let's give it a shot. Uh, Stephen then met with Bruce and so on, which was you had to have the local part, as Bruce explained. And then also on the management side, which Bruce was integrally involved. So the club was formed, and then you had a management team, had our challenges, and the rest is history in that the club did what it was supposed to do. I was more involved on the management side. And uh, since then, well, the rest is history. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Adrian. All right, so we're going to give the elder an opportunity. He would have served in the business over 50 years. I know he doesn't look a day past 51, but QB has seen the greatest of all athletes across the world, including some of the best Jamaicans. And he will just kind of explain to us how the business looked then and what the forecast is for the future. Well, the business back then was much better as far as athletes' appearance fees and even prize money. Uh, Contract-wise, with, with, with um, sponsors, it's better in this period of time. But here's the thing. We're at an educational institute, and I want to emphasize to all the students here that education is the most important thing in your life. You, you should be good student athletes. And I say that because at the end of an athletic career, you should be able to transition to something that you studied, something that you like. Now, I might be a little bit off topic in what I'm saying here. But a lot of misinformation and disinformation is out there about athletes that become pros and how much money you can make and how much money you can't make. I would say that maybe 10 or 15% of the athletes in the world make a very good living. And maybe Bruce will iterate some of that to me. A lot of the athletes that are out there, live from month to month, year to year, whatever. And some of you in the audience know this for a fact. So I always say to my athletes that education is the most important thing because I'm a product of education also. And I, I sit here and I have this wonderful job of representing a lot of athletes because I'm very educated. That's the bottom line. And they need somebody to represent them. Now, I want to talk a little bit about wealth and athletes that make money and athletes that don't make money. What is wealth? 
What is your definition of wealth? If I make $100,000 and I spend it all, am I wealthy? If you make $50,000 and you save $25,000, are you wealthier than me? Fine. So here is, here is what I've tried to do. I was never educated in finances. I'm educated in managing athletes. And I've tried to do a good job. But because I've seen what has happened in the many years of managing athletes where they've squandered millions of dollars, and because they've never had good people around them to advise them, and even the quote-unquote people that are educated to advise them, advise them wrongly. And you know for a fact, some of you, you have your little friends that are in your ears telling you this and tell you that. You ever notice that people that don't have anything, never did anything, but know everything? And this is one of your biggest problems. If you're not educated, you take advice from people that want to, hey, let's get this car. Let's go to this party tonight. Let, let do, let's do chase the girls. I'm telling you, I've lived it all. Everything you can do now, you can do when you're 30 years and on, over. So my advice to you is the talented ones that can make money right now, you get your priorities right and you focus. Now, for some of you that are making money, I say to you, save 75% of your money and spend 25% in whatever you think you need to do. Now, if you can't do that, then I would say, whatever money you have, you save some of it. You save some of it. You don't squander it all. 50% of your income is what you need. 30% is what you want. And 20% is what you save. Now you can make, you can variate that, 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 that matrix if you want. But I'm, she wants me to repeat it. But it's a very simple matrix. The bottom line is save. You know where I learned that from? I learned that from Shaq. Shaq has this matrix, and I've, and I've, uh, you know, I've, I do it myself, and it works. And we're in a period right now where this whole thing about investing and in doing this kind of, unless you know what you're doing, it's dangerous. There's inflation, there's all kinds of stuff. I advise you all to not only look at TVJ every night, turn on your TV if you have cable, and look at CNN, NBC, wherever, see what's going on in the world. Understand what's going on in the world. Get an idea of what's happening outside of the borders of Jamaica. And I'm only addressing the Jamaica situation here now. But I'm saying to you, put away your money. In Jamaica, they have what is called repos. In America, we call it CDs at high interest. Even if, if you put $5,000, if you have that much, or whatever, just put away money, save, save, save. Because believe you me, the, the longevity of an athlete, a really good athlete, is maybe nine to 10 years. And after that, the biggest problem I have is athletes who don't want to leave the stage because they have nothing to go to. So it brings me back to what I'm telling you about education and having something to go to, invest in your money and having good people advising you around you on how to put away your money and have something. So, Carol wanted me to explain to you, I do it, save 75% of your money, spend 25% of it. If you can't do that, then spend 50% of it on what you need. What you want, 30% and 20% save. But you can variate that matrix however you want, but you have to save every time, whether it's a dollar, two dollars. It works. Believe you me, it works. Get your priorities straight. And as I say that, don't listen to people who are in your ears, misinformation, disinformation. Everybody can be a superstar. Everybody can be an athlete running in Europe, making X amount of dollars. I say to athletes, when they say to me, well, why am I not running in Europe? Why does this athlete have a lane ahead of me? I say, look at the world list. There's eight or nine lanes on the track. Where do you belong? Are you belong in the top eight or the top nine 
or you're in a, the 30th or the 25. So how do you expect me to get a lane unless I'm Bruce James and I have a super athlete and I'm saying, in order to get this athlete, you have to take these other two. And it happens. It happens. The one thing I'll tell you is the truth. I'll tell you the truth. Thank you, QB. Um, I'm coming to James because QB would have seen, and if you know the names, from as far back as Merlin, all the way up to Johan. And so he has seen a full mix. But Bruce came in about in the middle part where he was part of what we call a transformation in Jamaica's track and field where this unit assembled and started and originated the management, training, and competition from Jamaica. Bruce, kind of give us an idea of how that has been in the last 30 years or so. Well, it was only 23 years ago, but <laughs> um, so I'm a lot younger than I look, unlike QB. But let me share with you, QB and I didn't share notes. And just listening to QB, I'm on the stage clapping because he's just dropping nuggets of value. The direction I want to take with what I'm sharing with you is the distinction between student athletes, athletes, and students. And there are three stages. And I'm gonna talk about the payer, payee. Who is a payer? Everybody knows who a payer. The payer pays. You know what the payee is? The payee receives. Then the next stage is employer, employee. The employer hires you. The employee is hired to do the work. And then finally, longe longevity. And again, QB touched on that a while ago. And again, we didn't compare notes. In high school, the payer versus the payee. Generally, the student athletes are payees. The student athletes grow up receiving. In Jamaica, as early as primary school, they could get a scholarship or get a scholarship to high school. Whereas all the other students are payers. They have to pay their school fees. They have to pay for lunch. They have to pay for their school uniform. So the, in the dynamic in Jamaica is that a lot of our student athletes growing up are only used to being payees. They receive and they get their scholarships, they get their school uniform. Their parents may even get benefits from them getting a scholarship to certain schools. Whereas all the other students are the payers, they pay to go to that school, paying, paying, paying. A very important transition happens when you become a professional athlete. As same thing happens when the students become professionals. Let's tell you what happens to a student when they go and get a job. That student starts becoming an employee. They are not an employer, they are receiving. Somebody pays them to come to work, they'll give them a desk, they'll give them a computer, they might give them a phone, they might give them a car, a company car. So when you, as a normal student, not an athlete, get your, go, go to university and get a job, you become an employee. Guess what happens to athletes, the professional athletes, when they now are ready to run and be performing? They become employers. They are no longer getting. I mean, they earn money, but they have to pay their coach, they have to pay their agent, they have to pay their manager, they have to pay the physio, they have to pay their rent, they have to pay. Suddenly, a professional athlete who all their life was getting and getting and getting as an E, a payee, and that's all they understood. It seemed free to them. They are now transitioning to an employer because the reality is even if the agent collects the money on your behalf, the athlete is the employer and has employed an agent, has employed a coach, has employed facilities, and there's this mystique that you think that when you fly to Europe, you don't like what I'm saying? The meat paid for you. No, the meat has decided that they have a budget and their budget is $100 for you. Now, you can take 
five of those hundred dollars for your plane fare, ten of those hundred dollars for your hotel, but they, you are the one paying it. They might pay it on your behalf, but it's your coming out of your number, and then they'll give you seventy dollars for coming and performing for them. But the athlete is the employer, and nothing is free anymore for the athletes. And I think that's an adjustment that athletes have a difficult time making because they grew up getting, getting based on their skill set. And then finally, just to touch on what QB said about the longevity. 10 years is the number I use QB as a long career. 10 years is a long career. Guess how long most employees work for? Remember, the athletes get 10 years if they're really good. A regular employee who used to be a payer in high school and college and then became an employee will probably work for 45 years. 45 years of being an employee and earning money. The athletes, these superstar athletes who you are seeing here, may get 10 years. They need to do something after those 10 years. So, to repeat, you start off as a payer or a payee in high school and college. Remember which one you are. As a student athlete, generally you're the payee. You transition to becoming an employer versus everybody else becoming an employee. And then finally, longe longevity. Your classmates who are not athletes will probably earn for about 45 years. You will probably earn for about 10. Mike, okay, so you now you understand. So not all of you necessarily want to be the athlete. And although we're heavy on track and field, there is football, cricket, boxing, netball, and some other sports. But it is important to get an education. And this is where, although he's a coach and could be representing a coaching part today he will speak to both in an instance where he says all right how do i coach you over that 10 year period or 15 if you're lucky and how do you maintain that there's life after so maurice thank you carol so i made a calculated decision a couple of years ago i looked at coaching professionally and I looked at continuing my career as an educator. And I made the decision that I wanted to collect a check every month and not to wait on whether or not I'm going to collect a, a, a check based on how well my athletes are doing. Why am I saying this? I'm going to be very realistic. So Bruce spoke about athletes that are in high school, young ladies from Immaculate, when you're in a high school program, your past students, your principal, the school community gives you everything. Then you decide to become a professional, not only athlete, sports person. Whether it is you're a cricketer, you're going to play 2020 cricket, or you want to get a contract to Chelsea. You notice I said Chelsea, right? Or you want to become a professional athlete. That is when every single thing changes. Because someone has to pay for the very average $200,000 a month that, re that is needed for your preparation. Hmm? You want me to break it down? An average three times a week at physiotherapy. No, massage. $5,000 a session, two times $16,000 for chiropractic work, do the math. We're not talking about food, because if you're at GC and you're on scholarship, you get food. You also get some physio help. But what about transportation? What about if you have to go to Kingston to the airport? When you look at the costs, we're not talking about paying coaches. Because if you pay the coaches, some of you, the coach will have to give you back the money. So you need at least $200,000 a month. 
Now, if you don't have a contract, someone has to pay that bill. There is no bill that you don't have to pay. You think you don't have to pay, but someone has to pay that bill. So how do you balance it? One of the policies we have at GC Foster, I do not take persons in the club who are not in school. So if you went to school, if you went to America, and you came back, whether on hard times or good times, and you want to train with the club, not a problem. But if you are leaving somewhere else, if you leave high school, and you decide you want to run professional, become a professional athlete, not Sprint Tech Track Club. You have to join a program at the institution or somewhere else. It is of critical importance because at Sprint Tech, we have persons who work at the college, who are professional athletes, work elsewhere, and they train as professional athletes. So there has to be a delicate balance because I don't know, the two agents are here, but based on my recollection, athletes really who are professional get a salary every six months. Think about it. So you have to plan your life, you know, how you are going to buy food, buy clothes, transportation, and sometimes go to parties for six months. So when you call it that check, you have to for six months most of the time. That is why Mr. Siglobin, or QB, he loves to be called QB, spoke about investment. I'm not going to tell you to buy a taxi, but if you have a taxi on the road, just for example, you collect a daily money, because you require money daily, you know, or you are going to have to take a loan. And then when you take that loan, and you get that check after six months, you don't remember you have a loan. So Bruce James and his club would have bought your ticket, go to Sweden. You forget about how the ticket was bought, you know. You know you never buy the ticket, you know. But you know you read Sweden, and you don't remember that you have to pay back that money. You have to pay back that money. It comes from somewhere. So let me just say that, and with due respect to um, Bruce, I think GC Foster offers the best package for emerging professional athletes. Let me tell you why. You can get an education, you can train. The great thing about your training, it is in the area of what you do best. So if you know about sports massage, because you have to get sports massage, it's easy for you to remember if you do a certification course. Coaching, well you are coaching every day, man. So it's easy for you to understand how you are supposed to do a particular drill. And so when we talk about a complete package, I'm not really marketing in the institution. I'm telling you the truth. GC Foster is a good starting point. So the end of it all, in terms of what I would have said earlier, is for you to do a delicate balance. Remember I said to you, you know, I had a choice. I could have coached professionally and I made a decision that I wanted to collect a check every month to be sure so you can decide to go to an institution, do your professional um, training, whether as a cricketer, footballer, and collect a check every single month. Thank you. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the difficult parts. And before I bring on Adrian, Marlon, you are coach in field events. Jamaica is largely a location where sprinting, or let's call them running events. How do you encourage, motivate, inspire athletes to stay in the field, particularly the jumps? Well, similar to um, the sprinters, um, we know we have a sprinting culture. We try to encourage, of course, field events athletes to understand that your gift. It's just like in music or in arts. Some DJ, some rap, some sing, some do opera. And that's pretty much their calling. And one of the things you try to encourage them is to be patient because of the technicality of the event. And naturally, it's going to take a little bit more time. A sprinter can come to the track and do four repetitions, but you might have to do 30 repetitions that many times 
is asking you to do the same thing over and over, but even better. And of course, the sprinter, similarly, but you have to do far more repetition. So we try to encourage them. Even from the high school stage, there's a popular thing I normally say, which is balancing academics with athletics. Um, you know, it's similar to what Sir James would have said before, and student athletes have to understand when you're able to balance academics with athletics, you sort of make your transition through the high school system with a, a little bit more discipline. So when the time comes and you are now a senior elite athlete, then of course you're able to manage your business. We know that some of the poorest or the weakest managers are those in entertainment. And as a result, you'd want to ensure from that, from, if each school practices that sort of system, then I'm, I'm sure the quality athletes coming out of high school is going to be different. They are going to be better managers. And if you're going to have 10 years that you're going to be calling the shots, you're going to be paying the coach. Because I've always said it about the profession. It's the athlete who pays the coach at this level, right? And any successful program is going to survive of athletes maintaining that level of success in order for coaches and staff, for the career of a coach to become something um, where they can earn um, successfully. And if that lifespan is that short, then of course the cycle has to continue. So, be, so balancing academics with athletics certainly is something that helps for that cycle later on in life. All right, thanks. I'm going to bring in Adrian now, where I'm going to ask him, we have so many brands in the world that you can make agreements with. So we have the shoe company, the gear companies, the beverages, the alcohol, all kinds of things. How do you, Adrian, determine what kind of relationships you go after for your athletes? It's an easy answer, but it, there are some complexities to it. The primary goal of an agent is to maximize rev all revenue opportunities for an athlete. Now, track and field itself possess some, cha some unique challenges. In that, when you look at basketball, you look at golf, you look at tennis, there is usually a three or four day gap in which they go through this intense training, play a game, and they get a three day break. And during that three-day break, they can take advantage of the different sponsorship opportunities which could come their way. Track and field, at a minimum, is six out of seven days. And what I've heard from coaches, when you miss one day of training, it's at least three days, at a minimum, it's going to take to make up for that. So the question you asked me is, how do you maximize those opportunities? It depends on where the athlete is at uh, and can they fulfill those response, those things which a sponsor is asking for. So the shoe companies want the medals. That part is true, and they'll do everything to make sure that the athlete spend as much time at training. Imagine you get something then from Pepsi. Pepsi now would need you to come to go to those different events. And you end up with a conflict in which a coach needs you at training. To that training, that's how you're going to produce the medal. And the sponsor is only interested in you if you have the gold medal or some form of a medal. So depending on what the expectations are of this brand who is interested is where the opportunity really comes up. If it is, they're going to need you once a week to turn up for different events, which is going to cost you missing two days of training, then it don't make sense. Ultimately, how you make it is a function to, of how much money it is, because you're in the sport to make money. Uh, but if taking the sponsorship will affect what your other revenue opportunities are, where most of the money usually comes from your shoe contract, you have to decide, does it make sense taking this opportunity if it's going to put your bigger contract at risk? So the money determines it, and will it affect you performing your day-to-day -day job, which is trying to get that gold medal? 
But where I repeat myself is the primary objective of an agent is to maximize every revenue opportunity. And the athlete objective is to win a goal. And you're trying to create that marriage of which brand allow the athlete to win the goal, which is what the, which is what the sponsor are going to be. And see if there is a marriage where you can't get the goal and maximize that revenue opportunity. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Yes, for sure. The shoe sure. companies have been here for a while. I think over the years, nationally, Jamaica would have explored relationships with Reebok, Adidas, Puma. Um, I don't think we have ever had a national Nike contract, QB, because the question is coming so. to you. How has, over the years, shoe companies won what was the first brand the shoe company we had as a contract here? And how has that morphed into the relationships we have formed in schools and with the professional athletes? Well, I want to touch a little bit first on the longevity issue that we were talking about, and then I touch a little bit on what uh, Mr. Lelo was saying. On the longevity issue, I have found that an athlete's, and I'm only speaking about Jamaica right now, the longevity of an athlete in Jamaica depends on the high school they went to, and how they fare in the high schools. And I say this because Coach Wilson can speak about this, Bruce James can speak about this, Mr. Gale can speak about this, Adrian Laylaw can speak about this. I have an issue with what goes on at Champs, Asia Champs. I want you to know, by the time an athlete comes to me or comes to Coach Wilson, or comes to MVP, the money we have to invest in getting somebody's daughter or son back to a normal person is crazy. You have no idea. Mr. Wilson was talking about it, and he transcended from a high school to a professional coach and a college coach. I can tell you it's something that has to be addressed in Jamaica. These kids, when they come to us, their legs are destroyed. Their, their, their joints are destroyed. We spend thousands of dollars sending them overseas to get them back to what you see some of them are. So don't think that when they come to MVP or they come to Sprint Tech or they come to me that we're making all this money. Because as Bruce James say, we invest so much and sometimes we come back with nothing. So depending on how an athlete comes out of school, the longevity as a pro, it's very dependent on what school that athlete went to, how many points they have to, to get for ISA to win a champ, for, for a school to win a championship. Now, let me tell you about some companies. Some companies, when you get to 26 and 27, they say, hey, you're over the hill. We want the 18, the 19, the 20 year old to sign. So an athlete can have many gold medals, and you've seen a lot of gold medal winners here. And once they get to 26 and 26, athletes, companies don't want to invest in them. And it's no, it's no different than you. You go to buy a car, you want to get the best car for your money. So why is it that a sponsor doesn't want to get the best athlete for their money? The most important thing, and I say this to the young athletes, attitude, personality, charisma. I watch some of our athletes. They have bad attitudes. And then they want to know why they don't have endorsements. I have sat with many big endorsees or endorsers in the world, and I said to them, hey, da 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 da, you know, I said to them, QB, you really want me to, to endorse an athlete with a million tattoos on their body? You really want me to endorse an athlete that doesn't speak well? You want me to endorse an athlete that has an attitude every time a media person speaks to them that can't say three words out of their mouth? These are the things that we're, we're in an uh, educational institution. These are the things that need to be taught. 
taught to these athletes how to represent themselves, how to project themselves. We have people, we have people in Jamaica that does that for a living, teach people how to speak properly. You can't go to Rome and speak Patois and expect that somebody in Rome gonna understand your Patois. Or go, go to, you know, well, England, that there's a little difference there. But these are the things that you need to, to really tell them about. So, the endorsement thing, people want to know, they say to me all the time, oh, why I don't have an endorsement? Why don't you have it? It's hard for me to give them the reality check. It's hard for me because you don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want to tell them, hey, maybe you should be more sociable. Maybe you should project yourself better. Maybe you should dress better. Maybe you should say good morning or good evening. Or when somebody puts a mic in front of you, in, in front of you and asks you, can you give me a two words? So you don't look at them and walk away. Because even when you're losing, you have to be gracious in losing. One of your, your, your greatest athletes is Shelly Ann Fraser Price. I mean, she's always bubbly. She's, people love her. They just, she's always bubbly. Even if she's lost, she comes off the track, she smiles, she laughs, she makes a joke about things. I'm telling you, I don't represent Shelly Ann, but I know what sponsors say about it. You know, I, I spoke to a sponsor recently that she just got an endorsement from, and they love her. They love her because she's just, she's just, you know, different. And that's what sponsors are looking for. And the longevity of an athlete depends on how they come out of high school. So you, if there's coaches here, pay attention to that. All right. So Bruce, you get the next question because social media has changed how athletes can now attract additional attention and in some cases money. How important is it for you as a club institution to encourage your athletes to be sociable? I'll use that word. How important is that for you? I'm, I'm starting to wonder if Carol has access to my speaking notes because we have not focused a lot on social media and social media is a big deal in 2024. I'll share with you that I started doing contracts in early 2000s. And when I did my first set of contracts, there was zero, zero reference to social media. That concept didn't even exist. And this is in the 2000s. And uh, today, the first line, well, before you even get the contract, as Kubrick tell you, the, pot, the potential companies who want to get you endorsing their products are going to go and look at your social media. They're going to see how many followers you have. They're going to see the type of messages that you have out there. And if they don't like the kind of messages you're putting out there, they may not even want to have you on, as part of their team. So social media is a big deal now. I, I'd be hard pressed to think of any athlete, and I'd say athlete meaning any sport, where you're among a top 10 in your sport, tennis, golf, cricket, anything, football, track and field, obviously, where they don't have a social media presence. It is so critical because the contracts today now say, they used to say we need five appearances and we need to make sure that you wear this and you need to dress this. You know what they say now? We need X amount of posts per week, per month. So your social media presence if it doesn't even exist, will need to exist as it assists Carol in terms of what the companies want. Because all those companies also have a social media presence. Oh, yeah. And all of those companies want the people that are endorsing their products to be able to share, tag, like, collaborate with them. So you're correct, social media is critical. I'm going to say something that kind of disagrees with everything I just said. You may choose not to have a social media presence, and you can still be a successful athlete. However, you will have an impact on your earnings. So it's not that it's a prerequisite for you to run sub 10, Hadrian, to, to get, you need to have social media. You don't need it, but the social media can help you. But running fast, the coach is going to help you there, your ability. But it does help because the companies are looking for that. The contracts include a big leaning on social media. All right. I know you have listened intensely. 
and I want to get the oh, QB ones. I'm going to open the floor in a while, so get your questions ready. Just circling back to what Bruce just said, and he can, he'll follow up on this. You know what the hottest contract is right now? You know what the hottest contract is right now? It's called in America the NIL contracts, which is legally college kids and some high school kids can sign an NIL contract. It's legal. Now, Bruce, explain to them what an NIL contract is all about. Erwin spoke about that. Again, QB has not prepared me for this, but an NIL is name, <laughs> image, and likeness contract. In the United States of America, they had this rule that said if you're a college athlete, you had to be amateur or not non-professional, you couldn't be paid. Right now, that rule has changed, driven, I think, by the basketball players and the football players, but it affects all sports. Track and field has benefited tremendously, where you can be paid for the use of your name, image, and likeness. And so, again, they, Andrian, if you're, they want to use your name, image, and likeness, they can pay you. You can still be on scholarship. They don't take away your scholarship, but they'll pay you. And these could be huge companies would come along and do this. So it's a big change in the United States and has been happening over the last year plus. And I think it's going to have a ripple effect throughout the, the industry. All right. So get ready with your questions. Adrian, I'm coming back to you in a little now because... One of the problems I've seen over the years is that we don't handle integration well. So what do you mean by one integration? of our sponsors, and I'll use Puma because it's the national, they have golfers, footballers, and all other sports. But I don't see any of them in track and field. How as an agent, you approach other athletes under the same brand to ensure that everybody gets together. One of our athletes, and I had the privilege of working for him, we shot Gatorade commercials here and abroad with Serena and Garnet, Kevin Garnet with Usain. And so we haven't done a lot of that. And all of the companies now have that. Adrian, what is the what, advantage what if, to getting what, what other if, athletes or other sporting people involved with your current athletes. And when you use the word integration, you mean get other athletes to their collaborations. Is that what you're asking me? You can see me. I'm Adrian? here. I heard the question, but there was a pause, Carol. No, I think the question. Ed. Right. Uh, I'm going to repeat what I believe you are asking because there was a pause. You're asking why is it we don't have more collaboration taking place with the athletes with various sponsors, in which let's say you have Tiger and uh, another another one of the elite athletes. That's what you're asking me, correct? Yeah. Right. There have been many, there have been a few attempts to get it done. Uh, with the exception of Bolt, I think, possibly you on, you haven't seen as much. Uh, my belief is amongst even the shoe company, it's difficult to have the different teams coordinate to make it happen. So there is enough blame to go around with it, which is one, the agent, two, the shoe company, yes, the athlete. But there have been attempts. Uh, but it's, I believe it's going to have to be ongoing where both the agent, both the shoe company, and the athlete to push because financially, how does it make sense? How do you get into this commercial? Will it pay? Will it give more exposure? But I, I know I can't speak for. QB, Bruce, and myself, it is something that we constantly push for because it does, the collaboration will give the athlete more exposure. So it is being tried to date. It's just not been as successful as we would like. And as I mentioned, there is enough blame to go around for it. But it's not for lack of trying. We just have to keep trying. And hopefully we touch the, make the right marriage for it, see the right things for it to take place. And any questions from the floor? Yes, there's a microphone right there. 
Question. Okay, my name is Michael Furtado, attorney at law, lecturer in law here at GC Foster College. I'm also a real estate attorney and I represent clients who buy and sell properties. My question is for QB. QB mentioned in his presentation, right, that the best way to invest money is to save, right? Now, the bank only gives less than 1%, right, in interest, right? So I have a problem with that. Also, you talk about buying a taxi. That's very risky, having a taxi on the road, because one crash can write off that taxi and your money gone down the drain, okay? Investing in stocks and bonds in Jamaica, that's another problem, right? Because the stock market has now crashed. It used to be 440,000, now it's down to 332,000. So my question to QB is asking QB, what's the best way for a successful athlete to invest his money to get returns over, say, a 10-year period? Because these, what he's thrown out in his presentation, the invest, investing in those kind of things is very risky, and you're not going to get the returns that are required. So that's my question to you. And I just, I, I just need one follow-up question after he answers that question. That's easy. That's an easy question. Okay. Real estate. Real estate is number one. And in Jamaica right now, both JNCB and Satacor have high interest repos, which means you can put your money away for a year at a higher interest than the 0.5 or the 1% that you get from a regular account. I do that myself. But I would say the number one investment is real estate. Buy as much land as you can. That's why the Chinese are buying so much of Jamaica. Because real estate is worth something. So if you buy a property now, which is what I'm in, I am pushing my athletes to do, I'm not interested in hedge funds or these, these other funds that are out there because that goes with the market. But real estate you can't lose in and high interest rate compound compound interest is the way to go right now in my opinion very good now i have a follow-up question and i'm going to throw this out to the audience i represent clients all right listen real estate i'm going to tell you two clients that i've represented right and then i'm done i have no more questions for today number one i have a client who bought a property in mango walk in 2005 he paid seven million dollars pre-construction he just closed on the property he closed on the property Last year, last year, June, you know how much he got for that property? $47 million he got for that property. No, I'm sorry, $37 million, right? He got for the property. He made 30 in what, 15 years? And one other case, I'm just going to leave you another case. I have a client who bought a property in 2007 in, in Ligony. He paid $5 million for a one-bedroom townhouse. You know how much that property is worth now? Right now, he can get 25 million for that property, okay? So, so gentlemen, people, if you have money, invest in real estate. That's the best way to invest your money, okay? Real estate. Don't go to no stocks and trade. Thank don't you. Don't put no money in no bank and don't, and, and don't buy no taxi. Real estate is the way to So, So you're endorsing what I said? All right. So, so are you yeah, but, you're but, endorsing but it, what I said? Yeah, but, but in Cuba, you one. But you, did, but you didn't because, say that in your presentation. I, I, no, no, no. I've but Cuba. I've that in Jamaica too. Hold yeah, on, but, but Cuba. I bought a property in 2015, and it's worth four times the money right now. Yeah. But, but you, the problem is you didn't mention that in your presentation. You talk about taxi, that, and you spoke about interest in bank. Don't put no money in no bank. The interest you get is only less than 1%. But I just the taxi, but I just told you one crash with the taxi, it's Hold written off, your money gone down the drain. Real you. estate is the way to go. And I'm done for the day. Go, Mr. Park. <laughs> All right. Before Carole. the next question, remember, if you are Carole. in a position like a coach, a manager, an agent, and in my case, a publicist, you can actually have multiple clients and you can earn and work for 40 years. So you always don't have to be the athlete. Next question. Thank you very much. My question is a twofold one. Now, you mentioned something about when the student athlete or any athlete comes to you, their uh, health situation, some of them needs remediation, needs 
all sort of therapy to get them up to speed. The question is, from a policy standpoint, because we're looking at the business of sports, from a policy standpoint, what can the government do and what is your role as coaches and managers to influence these both athletes and coaches at the lower level to recognize the importance of taking care of our athletes at the primary and high school so that they can transition into a pro athlete. Training. Training is all important. And that is what we do here at the college. We train the coaches, we prepare them, no, firstly, they pay us to train them. And we train them, we, we send them to the institutions. But let us, be, let us be real now. Jamaicans care only about winning, most of us. So we, we do not care about the process. What we care about is that class two boy who was spoken about yesterday, who ran 46 seconds. If next year he runs 47 seconds, we say he's not performing. So we want him to run 45 seconds. So with the impetus, with the supporters who support these sort of things, the coaches, if they do not control the, their ego, they will continue to train. It doesn't matter how well they are prepared when they leave the institution or institutions of training. They are going to go there to please the public. When we have a particular championships in Jamaica, sometimes we have 20,000 persons there from all over the world. They come to watch our athletes perform. And it is about the competition. It's about bragging rights. So then the coaches are only, most of them, are motivated to get the best performances from their athletes. Now sometimes we confuse, and QB spoke about the matrix. There's a difference between being overtrained and burnout. One is physical, your muscle. It has an impact, the training has an impact on your muscle. And one is psychological. You don't want to do it anymore. I am tired of having to go to training. The only person who should be tired are the professional athletes because they are paid to train, to market a brand. But for the high schooler, training should be ledger. It should be fun. But because the coaches, and you can't blame them, sometimes the authorities, they expect the supporters, past students, old boys, old, old ladies, no. Young ladies, old girls, they support their schools. They want to see improved performances every year. And so sometimes the pressure on the coaches to keep their jobs, to continue to be in the spotlight. Because you know the most popular coaches in the world are high school coaches in Jamaica. They come in the paper and on radio and on social media than any other coach in the world. And so these things have to be governed. So it doesn't matter the training that is um, given. What is important is how they manage the information that they would have received. Manage your egos and understand that burn, psychological burnout is the worst part of training. All right. So the follow-up question is, the sports policy that the government is working on, how can we, what should we suggest to the government so that they can regulate these coaches, regulate the program so that we can assist the students? Because if, if we don't, you know, it depends on the ego of the coach. It depends on the all those factors that Mr. Wilson has spoken about continuing and so the student athlete will always be left at the, 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 the end of the stick 
with all the injuries. So what, is it, what, what can the government now put in place from a policy decision to assist in regulating the sporting fraternity? Listen, listen, that's a very easy answer. Many of the federations and associations in Jamaica, they want to be independent. They don't want, they want to be independent. And the, the biggest secret in Jamaica is that the government does, whichever government is in power, does give a lot of funding to the, the federations and associations. You just don't know it. You know, you know when the reggae girls were stranded overseas and in England and in Canada and all over, they were saying, oh, why don't the, why don't the Jamaican government bring them home and help them? The, government, the Jamaican government was given 35 million. But did you know that? But all these federations, all these associations, they want to be independent. But then when they get in trouble, they want the government to be dependent. It's not right, it's not fair. All right, any, any other questions? Last, last one. Oh, Marlon, sorry, go ahead. I, I wanted to take a different approach. Many persons have used the term from grassroots to greatness in many, many sports. And on this, on this particular matter, Sir Wilson would have mentioned, every coach would have gone through formal training, understands child development. They understand the physiological adaptation that takes place in exercise. They know cycles, whether it is a weekly cycle, monthly cycle, etc. And what are the anticipated um, adaptations that will take place? Coaching is not coaching for miracle. It is applied science. While it is not exact because different person adapts at different rate, it is something that every coach has to take in consideration. But we, in the respective programs, have to understand if, as we would have mentioned, longevity, if we want to give the athlete the longest possible career, we have to take in consideration what is appropriate for them to achieve now. And it is the responsibility of every program to understand that you don't make money at champs. What you are supposed to be doing is setting a platform that allows our youngsters an opportunity at the next level to be the very best they can be because that's where you make the money. And that's where the employee pays the employer in, in, in such a case. And I want to relate to something Ms. Beckford had mentioned. I, you don't know that I looked at the post. And I did the conversion in Jamaican. World champs. The prize money in Jamaican was 1.3 billion Jamaican dollars. If at the senior level, that's what you're working towards, I am sure less than 20% is going to benefit from it. And as a result, and I could be off a little bit, as a result, we have to ensure that we prepare our youngsters for that stage. All right, final um, young lady. Oh, um, okay. Mike, we have Mike them lining question. up. Sure. Yeah. The question is um, to Mr. J. Spoke about the uh, employee employee pay and payout. So when the person comes from the student perspective and they are now entering into the professional world where they become employee, what is put in place psychologically, emotionally? What is put in place psychologically, emotionally, to help these persons transition and to understand what is required of them now to make them be able to be a better employer? Yeah, that's what I really want to know. Because psychologically, for you to be given and you are receiving, and now you're at a stage where you'll now have to give and you don't have that kind of, what is put in, what kind of financial things and psychological things are put in place, advise the person. All uh, right, thank you so much for that question. And, and the reality is not enough is currently being done and it really depends on the group that you join. The vast majority of Jamaican athletes now, and internationally as well, QB will tell you, 
have joined groups. I know a lot of us think that track and field is an individual sport. You're kind of out there in your own lane, but I would say over 90% QB, but you can correct me, are part of a group, not just in Jamaica. I don't just mean sprint tech MVP racers. I'm saying internationally, because you need that group, that support, because the transition is a big one. And that's why I mentioned employer to employee. If you're the right group and you can see what happens with the other athletes and how they learn, I'll use Usain Bolt as an example. When he had other people joining racers, Usain was kind of preaching to the younger athletes about how they should manage it because the stories of superstar high school athletes who have not made the transition, unfortunately, is way, way too large. But the question is, what can be done? Be in the right group and make sure that you get the right guidance. Um, Ms. Wilson, I heard the question, and I'm going to be straightforward on this question. Most times, the athletes will listen when they're not doing well, or they have not reached that level of high performance. Once they reach that level, they stop listening. The, the other side to it is, the athletes will listen to those persons who have no financial knowledge, and QB made mention of it. So they will take advice from persons who are no example in terms of what financial management should be. They stick with their friends, their, um, I think they use the term groupies or whatever you want to call it, family members who were not able to assist them when they needed help. Those are the persons when they are successful, some of them take advice from. So that's a, true, that's a truism. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sasha Jones from Harper Grove, and I would like to direct these questions to the principal, Mr. Maurice Wilson. Um, what are the qualifications needed to attend GC Foster, and what are the programs you guys offer here? All right, um, excellent question. We have a variety of programs. We have a four-year program that is in teacher education. You need five subjects, inclusive of math and English. But if you have four subjects, we can build you up. That's the term I'm going to use until you have your required number of subjects so you can start your program. We have associate's degree in which you can start with five subjects, four subjects. We have preliminary programs, again, that can assist you in getting your uh, CSEC subjects that you need. After you have completed your two years, you can do another plus two to get a bachelor's degree. But what is interesting about what we do here, we can tailor the program for you. So let's say you come in with exceptional talent. You're going to play netball, fast five. You're going to play 2020 cricket, but you are traveling a lot. So you don't have the time to do all the courses on a regular basis. We can tailor made a course for you. So after one year, you are certified. So if you decide to take a year from school, you can work at a hotel, you can set up as an entrepreneur, you can set up a massage center, what are you doing, recreational massage or sports massage. But to complete all of that, after you have completed your bachelor's program, we have a master's program that is similar to what you would have been doing for the four years. So it makes it not easier, but you are able to, man to, to handle yourself better in getting certified. The greatest thing about GC Foster College, once you are disciplined, you will not leave the institution without you are certified. All right, final comments. Adrian will bring before, after this question. So please prepare your final comments. Hi. I Annie Brown, I am from Happy Grove High School. I am an A student. I also do track and field and football. And I'm wondering the benefits that GC Foster College have for me because my parents are not so rich. Did you say that you were an A student? Yes, sir. That's great. So, so why aren't you looking, I know you're looking at G.C. Foster because you say your parents can't afford to 
Staying you someplace else? And you're in track and field? Yes, sir. Have you tried to look at overseas uh, scholarships? Not as yet. You haven't? No. Well, do, would you consider looking at overseas scholarships? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Coach Wilson is saying I'm trying to take you away from Cheesy Foster. No, but I'm saying you have good grades. Are you a good athlete? You can say so. Well, then you, you need to look at all of your options. And then maybe, you know, if you want to stay home close to your family, you can consider GC Foster. But I'll let Coach Wilson answer that question. We have a policy at GC Foster. No student is turned away. So the first thing that you'll have to do is to do an application. You can go online, everything is there. Now we offer what we call payment plans. We do expect that services must be paid for, but we will sit with you, have the discussion. The fact that you have mentioned that GC Foster College is your first choice. The lady that is directly behind you in that black top, please give her your name, your phone number, and your address, and we'll have further discussions. Thank you, sir. All right, two quick questions. Let's go. Don't be shy. Immaculate. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jamie Lee Tolo from the Immaculate Conception High School. And I would like to, as a thrower myself, I would like to know why is it that runners get more attention than throwers and jumpers? And what can be done to improve and also influence other athletes to come over, you know, the throwing and jumping side? aspects of track and field. I, I, I'm sure that QB and Marlon want to answer a question. And like you, I wish the jumpers and throwers got more attention. It's really, in my opinion, and gentlemen, feel free to disagree, it's really driven by the shoe companies. For whatever reason, the shoe companies seem to think there's more glamour on the track. And so they tend to reward the sprinters more than the hurdlers, more than the distance runners, except maybe until you get to the marathon level. So it's really driven a lot by, I guess, market surveys where they believe that the sprinters are the most glamorous. But like you, I think if we keep pushing and get the jumpers and throwers to keep doing amazing things, we could have more, more attention there. I don't know, QB, Marlon? One more question. What is the difference between studying here and overseas? Again, I'll be quick on this, and then, but the, the, the quickest difference is the adjustment. I find that the student athletes have adjusted to college, university life in Jamaica more easily than when you go overseas. You go overseas, new culture, new country, new weather, new climates. Uh, the, the structure and infrastructure is different. I mean, I went on a scholarship, I went to Florida State University, and there are things I discovered about myself that I didn't realize, because I just grew up, I was tall as slim as a lot of things, but when I got to the States, the first thing I was made aware of was my race. I, I, you know, race was not a big factor for me growing up in Jamaica, so the food is different, and let me tell you, if you get a scholarship to a, a university in the North, it's gonna be cold. My daughter right now is in Chicago, and she sends me Freezy emojis every day. So a lot of differences, Marla. Well, um, the culture shock that you would experience abroad is not the same as you would experience here. You're, you're closer to home, so it's kind of easier for you to um, manage that. But also it can unearth um, other aspects of your life that you weren't aware of. So um, I think it's, your, it's a choice that you'd have to make in terms of where you'd want the next stage of your life um, um, to be. But definitely, GC Foster is always one of your best choices once you're interested <laughs> in sports or sports-related um, careers. Thank you. All right. Last uh, question. This is definitely the last question. Hi, my name is Nala White. I was wondering what packages that GC Foster they give out and have towards sports medicine um, careers. All right, so we do not offer sports medicine per se, 
but the supporting courses that you do here can facilitate that transition into sports medicine. Because we do a number of science courses that will help you if you want to transition in sports medicine, kinesiology, physiology, anatomy, all those supporting science courses, practical courses in sports massage. So it can be a platform, a stepping stone to further your studies in sports medicine. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna to go to Adrian first for his wrap up statement. And it really probably should focus on one, what it takes to be an agent and what if any bit of advice you have to give anybody who want to pursue that as a, as a career. Right. Right. I'll save that part for last. But good afternoon again. I want to comment though on that question the young lady asked, which was between the sprinters versus the throws. It's a function of TB ratings and it's also a function of the region. So in North America, you'll find the sprinters get lots of attention, so they'll be paid more. There are certain parts of Eastern Europe in which the hammer throw is the star, so the TB there will get more, that person will get more attention, possibly paid more by the shoe company. So the payment to an athlete in some respect depends on what region you're from, how much attention you're getting because the shoe company wants brand awareness. The whole idea is, will the public want to be like this star? So you may have an athlete paid well in North America, which is in sprinting, but you may have the long jumper from Germany. Uh, she'd probably be paid well, and TV ratings are different there for female long jump. So it's a function also of the region and how popular you are. And uh, the shoe company going to pay attention to that because their goal is how do I increase brand awareness, which ultimately lead to sales. Uh, commenting also on the part of both uh financial and investment apart from the gentleman who was self-promoting himself it's a very tricky area as related to real estate and so on i do believe athletes generally should become be more be more financially literate the agent plays a role i think ultimately what we should do is try and find the experts in each particular area and guide them towards learning more from each person who may be an expert in the financial area. I don't consider myself necessarily an expert, but I know who may be very good at it. So real estate may be an option, but one of the dangers with real estate is the athlete may borrow money. When the athlete borrows the money with the hope that this career of mine may continue for another two or three years, then suddenly there is this catastrophic injury. You now have to sell this property, which it's difficult to sell it within one, two, or three months. So uh, what I would advise is let's see how we can make them more financially literate and at the same time have the athletes even speak to different people who are experts in that area and then come to an informed, uh, an informed decision. Uh, overall, before I get to the part about agent, it is true they said that 82% of athletes which earn 50 or more million dollars in their career are going to be broke three years after retirement. And that's global. It's a frightening number. And one of the things is that the athlete, what makes them good is also what makes you weak. You've got to believe you're the best. And striking that balance, which is this is really, chances are five years, you're lucky if you get 10, uh, hoping you can communicate to them that, boy, this thing may not be too, may not be too long. Because the challenge that the athlete face is you earn this income, you start a lifestyle, but the lifestyle is based on it's going to remain for the next 20 or 30 years, which it will not. The crooks of the problem. 
having the athlete recognize this lifestyle in year one or year two cannot be sustained at age 22 all the way up to age 50 because chances are your income is only going to be for the next 10 years. I think it's yes, us, the family, us agents to successfully get that message across. Remember the income which you're earning now is to go until age 50, 60. And that part is not easy. Um, now track and field, a truly, truly exciting career. I mean, here it is, you have the high school kid who is being told they're the greatest, they're the greatest. And then suddenly we are saying to the athlete, become a professional. And that's not easy. I mean, the reason I send you off to war at age 17 or 18 is because the person foolishly believe they're going to survive or don't think they're going to die. The athlete also, as I said, at that young age being told they are great is suddenly being told, by the way, you're not so great and you have another set. Uh, I said that to say, it is truly an exciting career. Chances are what an athlete say in one year most people won't see in their lifetime. So you want them to be excited about getting into this career. You want us to successfully communicate. Guys, there are guys and girls, there are some challenges and to be successful at it, it's about managing that money. How can you identify who would be the right agent, the right coach? And some of the answers are relatively easy, which is there is a reason why some people have been around for 40 years. There have been a reason why some of the coaches have been successful at it for 20 years. And you hope for those in the audience who are looking at this career, look at those who have been around for a while, look at the coaches who have been successful, and you're trying to increase your chance of being successful, and those things do help. Choosing agents who have been around, choosing agents who you see who have had some success with athletes, and likewise with the coaching. Regarding being an agent, um, another exciting career. Uh, the stats show that most sacrifice in terms of family, I do think most of the agents, Cube in particular, uh, go all in for the athletes. They really, really want. Most agents that I'm associated want the athletes to do well. So what does it take? Um, understanding when I say, the first thing I would do is try and see which agent is considered, has been around for a while. And uh, so the ultimate compliment is copying success. So you speak to the person constantly evolving. What the agent did successfully, 80s, 90s, even 2000, is probably outdated here now. As Bruce and you, Karua, mentioned, social media has changed the game. And even then, the companies themselves do even understand how best to use it. But you want to speak to Cuba, myself, Bruce, and others to understand what does it take to maximize? What are the emerging trends? Uh, what you're trying to make as much money for the athlete, and what are the emerging areas in which you said this is where the athlete can maximize their revenue potential? So at start first, identify three people in which you can have a wrap with. And I'm pretty sure from the three, you get a guide on this is the path which works best for me. So there isn't a the only clear cut way which I believe to increase your chance of success is speaking to somebody who has been around for a while, have a few agents, listen to more than, speak to more than one agent, and then find a method which will fit your style. Uh, Hopefully, I've answered your question. Ruby, you get the last word to just wrap up here. Um, what, if any, advice you'd have to give to young people who want to get into business generally? Hello. Um, quickly to wrap up, um, I know we spoke about a lot of stuff here and a lot of informative stuff. But I want to emphasize that although we're in Jamaica and we're speaking about all sports here, 
the issues that we speak spoke about it's not just limited to the athletes here it transcends the nba the nfl uh, soccer league hockey everything it's the same issues that we have discussed just different sports and that's what all i'll say everything we've spoken to you about transcends to all other sports even in america thank you for your time all right um the session has officially ended, but the principal has an announcement that he'd like to make. No, no, I don't have an announcement. But I want to say, Shakari Richardson, she has 3.3 million followers. And this is for the persons who are on social media. At the last Olympics, no, Tokyo Olympics, there were 15.6 billion followers. For those of you who, are on, who watch YouTube, and you know about Spotify, how much it pays, think about it. So she's way ahead of all track and field athletes with 3.3 million views. In a couple of months' time, we'll be having the Olympics. What are you doing, professional athletes, to elevate your brand, to monetize your brand? Think about it. In a couple of months, at least 10 billion persons will be watching you on television. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have listened to how people transition from high school to college, to amateur, to professional. Let's give these gentlemen here and online a big round of applause. Thank you very much. So you heard from Marlon Gail, Adrian Laidlaw, Bruce James, QB Segovin, Maurice Wilson, I'm Carol, thanks for listening. Thank you so much. I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, we had a very fruitful discussion and a number of persons are walking away with a lot of information that they can use going forward. At this time, we're going to be making some presentations. All right. At this time, we're going to be making some presentations and we have Ms. Ruth and Sanderson who will be speaking on behalf of the group. We all enjoyed that presentation, right? So can I have a round of applause, please? <laughs> all right. So our first presentation is to our moderator, Ms. Carl Beckford. Carl. To our principal at GC Foster College of Physical Education and Sport, Mr. Maurice Wilson. Mr. QB Segovin, manager and agent. Mr. Bruce James. <laughs> and, and to Mr. Marlon Gale, my dear coach. And we can assure Mr. Laidlaw, or Laidlaw that he'll get his presentation at a future date. Thank you. <laughs> 